So this is a, let me go back to this one, this is a classic diagram, an older diagram of evolution. Key point here though is that you can connect everything back to common ancestor. The other thing we can say is that the tips of the tree of life, the ends of the branches represent modern organisms. And if you want to know how closely related you are to something else, you just trace your ancestry back to this tree of life and measure the distance. So here, evolution would say humans are more closely related to monkeys. Not that humans came from monkeys per se, but that they shared a common ancestor in the more recent past at least more recent than, let's say, fish and humans. And here's a more recent diagram from the Tree of Life website, which I just downloaded recently. Same principle again. Tips of the Tree of Life are modern organisms. You want to know who your common ancestors are, just trace your path back through the tree to find who's closest to you. Here's an idealized diagram. Tips of the tree, which I've drawn just to make a point now. Again, the tips are modern organisms. You trace ancestry back to these connecting branches. Now what does creation look like? It may surprise you to know that it's essentially this. The same thing, just that the connections are moved. So here's evolution, here's creation, and what was created 6,000 years ago, we'd say, would represent the bottom of these little diagrams, and that what we see today again, are the tips of the branches. Now we don't have to keep it in this sort of ordered structure. We can put them all over the slide if we want to, because again, from the Genesis text says there's no relationship or connection between these organisms. The second thing we should say is that the Genesis text does not forbid classification. So the fact that we can classify organisms as having similar structures isn't necessarily <laughs> disproving creation. There's, the Bible says there's one creator, not many, so it wouldn't be surprising if there were similar design features, similar engineering features. So what do you love connectedness? So now I have to give you a little bit of a molecular biology lesson to explain the data I'm going to show you now. So a study from C is a protein uh, textbook example of molecular evolution is a biochemistry textbook. It, its function is not important. So you may ask why we're talking about proteins if, which, if evolution revolves around a protein. So this is now a molecular biology lesson. And the letters for proteins are there are about 20 of them, 20 standard ones, amino acids we call them. And proteins are essentially just strings of these. They form different structures. They can be different lengths. But the key thing is we can all line them up. And because we can line them up, and I you can't see in the back, it's just a string of little circles, an idealized representation, different colors to represent different letters. And now we can compare these between different species. These all species share the, share the same, you know, all species share the same biochemistry. So yeast, so the protein we're going to look at is study from C, just because these are the sequences I have in hand, and it's a textbook example. And you can find it, this little protein word in yeast, you can find it in fish, and plants, and humans. And so it's a great tool to ask, what is the relationship between all these different species? So we can again use this little idealized diagram, line up these sequences, and say, where do we see matches? Where do we see the letters all lined up in the middle? Or do we see that at all? So this is all the molecular biology you need to know. These next slides are simply going to be numbers, percent differences among this one word among different species. So let me put up this diagram. I'm going to have the next slide. I'm going to move it up a little higher so you can see it in the back. If you need to stand up, that's fine too. So here's human protein word cytochrome C compared to a whole bunch of different organisms. I have a bigger data set than this because of the limits of slide size, so I condensed, condensed it just to uh, relevant ones and then a representative. So you can see here that chimp cytochrome C, protein word, and chimp human cytochrome C in mouse are about 9% different, so there's some differences. Cow difference is greater. And then down at the bottom here, yeast, it says 39% different from humans. Then you can actually do this experiment yourself. All these sequences are freely available online. There are tools to compare them, algorithms to do the math. Now, if all of this is all the data you had, you might say, well, this looks like evolution. We had humans and chimpanzees identical, and evolution says they shared a common ancestor in the more recent past. Yet yeast and humans, which showed you under evolutionary paradigm, having diverged in the much more distant past, have much greater difference. What you may not know is that if you look at all the comparisons, so now we're going to compare every organism to every other organism and make it fill in the complete table here. I'm going to fill it in now for you. I haven't filled in this side just because it's a duplicate of this. This is all the numbers that are relevant. You can't see in the back on the next slide. Let's see, there it is. So you can hopefully see in the back. What's quite fascinating is that yeast is 39% different from humans, but also from chimps down here. This is 39%, 39, 39. It's basically 39% different from everything above it. These, this is 40, this is 43. Those differences aren't relevant in biology is really recently. So the take-home message here is that 
Yeast is about equally distant from everything above it. They're the epicenter from humans, but also from chimps, all the way down to plants and fruit flies. So now let's use this data table, one row at a time, to build our own tree of life. So using this first row, again, yeast, 39% different from chimps, from fruit flies, from plants, from fish, everything, I've listed in the table. Again, this is a condensed version of a bigger data set. We have to draw them on the left side here and put everything else over here on the right side. And, use, and to represent this equal distance, we'll use lines of equal length. And then this way, build a tree of life. 39%. So here's one row of data. And unfortunately, I haven't moved these other, uh, the, the table up. I can just go back here, we you see. Now we're just going to move up the table here. Notice the patterns all hold true to each level. Plants is about 38% different, 39% different for everything above it. At every level of the table, you see this echo distance. So I'll just now advance to what I had up here before. So here, plant, same pattern that holds true, as I said, 38% from humans, but also from chimps, from mouse, from just about 39% different from everything, including fruit plots. Now let's incorporate this data into our tree of life. Again, this data still holds true. We can't modify it because that's the bottom row of the table. We must preserve it. So let's preserve that 39% distance from plants to yeast, preserve the yeast to everything else distance. Now let's incorporate that second piece of data, the distance between everything above plants, which is 39%. So now we have a triangle, two rows of data. Let's now move to the third row of data. Here we have fruit fly, 24%, 17, roughly all about 20% different from everything else. Again, this. Biological, this is just biological noise. If you had a bigger data set, it wouldn't strike you as significant. So let's replace the group up here with fruit fly, because again, it is 39% different from yeast, also from plants. But now where are we going to stick this group? Again, it's 39% from yeast, from plants, but also 20% from fruit fly. Really, the only way we can do this is to go into the third dimension, which I've tried to depict here on this two-dimensional screen. Think of this as a pyramid projecting out towards you. The group is at the tip of the pyramid. It's a little bit asymmetric because the numbers aren't all exactly equal. But we, with this diagram, preserve all the rows of data in the table. 39% different from yeast to everything we have present. 39% different from plants to everything above it. And now this third piece of data, 20% different from fruit flies to everything above it, which I've represented by the group. So that's three rows of data. Let's now go to the fourth row of the table. If you can't see in the back, this is, again, the same, same pattern holds true, about 12% different from zebrafish to chicken the dog, the horse, everything above it. And now we can add this to our table. Again, here's our attempted three-dimensional visualization. Let's replace this group with zebrafish, which again, it, so as we have drawn the table currently, it's still accurate. 39% to yeast from zebrafish, 39% to plants, 20% to fruit flies. Now, where are we going to stick everything above zebrafish? If you follow this closely, you'll notice that the number of dimensions we've had to use is one less than the number of organisms. So we had Oops, let me go back here. If we had, uh, when we had three organisms, we were, we were able to draw three dimensions. When we had four, we were able to draw three dimensions. So you may guess now that the only way we can incorporate this new data, new row of data into our diagram, is to go into the fourth dimension, because we have now five groups. And I can't draw that for you, because the maximum we can think about, unless you're a math wizard, is basically in three dimensions. And so if we were to go up this table, let me go back here now, row by row, we did the same pattern moving through, the number of layers we have in the number of dimensions. So we'd be up to the, probably the 10th dimension by the time we got finished. And again, this is a condensed data set. So just to reiterate, the distance from yeast to everything above it is equal for this protein. From plant to everything above it is equal. So consequently, this means we really can't draw a two-dimensional tree of life. We're not closer to yeast. We're not closer to, let's say, plants than we are to yeast, or closer to fish than we are to yeast. We're all equally distant from yeast based on this protein sequence. We can't say we're closer to, let's say, chimps than we are to yeast, because chimps and humans are equally distant from yeast. So this is a really profound conclusion to wrap your mind around. And to give you the uh, what someone else tell you how profound it is, this is Michael Denton, who first pointed this out back in 1986. He said, considering the enormous variation of species from unicellular organisms like yeast, to multicellular organisms, such as mammals, this must be considered one of the most astonishing findings in modern science, this equidistance, which really suggests that life is not related and 